In today's webcast, we'll be taking a deeper dive into predictive security with guest speaker Rick Holland, a senior research analyst at Forrester Research, where he serves as security and risk professionals, and Dan Hubbard, a security industry veteran with more than 20 years of experience. Now I'm going to hand things off to Rick. Rick? So thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it. I know everyone's busy and uh, setting aside an hour or so of your, your day is no small feat, so I, I appreciate that. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to kind of walk through a few things um, and then jump into it. Um, but there's a quick outline of what's going on. You know, when I, I do lots of webcasts, several a week usually, and I always start off with, it's kind of a forester style type of thing, where we talk about the threat landscape. And I've been doing these now for two years now, and I'm every three or four weeks, I'm updating logo slides. And so I decided that I just would stop doing that. So in all webcasts I do now, I generally start off with this. Insert your cliche, uh, we're surrounded, overwhelmed, imagine no line failed, whatever cliche you want to put in here and then insert your company logos and of course we know they're they're all going to change on who gets popped almost on a weekly uh, or certainly a monthly basis you know two that stand out to me recently one is the the syrian electronic army attacks against the new york times and uh and, and some other properties as well and then also one of my favorite although this has happened a little bit uh, earlier in the year which if you haven't read about it you should it was the uh, Department of Commerce Economic Development Agency. Um, this is a situation where they wanted to see APT, expected to see APT. They, they responded to some commodity malware um, by destroying $2.7 million worth of, of IT equipment, including mice, keyboards, monitors, and things like that. I'd say it's a pretty sophisticated uh, attacker that's able to take over your mouse. Um, so that's an example of how not to respond to the threat landscape. But I know just within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to update this with new new quick stories on how overwhelmed we are and how challenging it is. But moving into the topic of what we've got today um, is big data. And we know that big data is dominating the headlines. Uh, a couple that I just picked out from a quick Google News search, uh, you know, why is big data making security exciting again? I always thought security is exciting. Maybe I just like our, our profession too much. I didn't think it ever lost that. Um, and then needle and haystack, harnessing big data for security. Needle and haystack's a nice one too. You hear that all the time, talk about cliches, needle and haystack, needle and needle stack. Um, just because something is cliched and big data in itself is overused term as well, doesn't mean there's not value in it. So I think that's important to remember while at the same time enjoying making fun of it. Um, moving on, I thought this would be interesting. Um, RSA Europe is uh, at the end of the end of October in Amsterdam, and they recently, in a blog posting, they put up uh, all the submissions that they had. Um, this word word list of of the most popular ones, and if you take a look at the ones that stand out, we've got cloud, we've got data, and we've got big. Um, there's no doubt that this is a hot topic for people submitting, and and, and people want to learn more about it. Um, you also see cyber there, speaking of cliche things, and I think mobile. Uh, is no surprise, risk, attack, but I think this, these are important. I'm, I'm curious to see how this will transition to what they release for the U.S. submissions um, when they get announced, uh, hopefully in the next couple months. But moving on, so big data to the rescue, right? It's it, Every vendor is talking about big data. Um, companies are interested in big data. I've got some, some, some survey data that talks a little bit about that in, in, in a little while. You know, things that we hear about or we saw in uh, in minority report beginning to come true, of course, person of interest. Now that show gets a whole lot more interesting um, now with the re re revelations of what the NSA has been doing. But you get the picture, right? One of the things, and we know about the the three V's of big data, and I'm going to touch on them in a little while. But what I thought would be interesting was to talk about the three V's of big marketing. Um, as an analyst, I, I get briefings from vendors all the time. Um, both vendors that are doing big data, infrastructure solutions, architecture, that type of stuff, as well as the vendors that are leveraging big data implementations to help you do your jobs better. Um, and a lot of times it's really difficult to understand, uh, to distill truth from what they're saying. So I came up with the three V's of big marketing. Um, the first one is valueless, uh, without worth or value. Vague, not clear or explicitly stated or expressed. Vain, ineffectual, or unsuccessful, unsuccessful or futile. Um, it, it really is difficult to understand, and, and, and I'll talk about some strategies for trying to make sense of 
of, of what someone's marketing is versus what the value that they deliver is. Um, moving on, big data definition. So a little while ago, right, I talked about the three Vs of big data. Of course, we have volume. That's the size of the data that's going to be processed. Of course, we've got kilobytes all the way up. Um, there's large amounts of data. We need to be able to have scalable storage for this. Um, we need the ability to query with all this data that we're pulling in. Um, velocity, the second V of big data. Uh, velocity is the rate at which data flows in and the ability to ingest it. Um, and it also has the ability, and we'll talk about this more as well as output um, and what's coming out, how, how quickly we can get things out. And then finally, we have variety. And this is the types of structured and unstructured data that, that, that exists. And the unstructured piece is one of the key components here. Uh, data that doesn't fit a traditional relational structure, not in a typical database. Um, we're trying to put order to this unstructured data to, to see what it means. I mean, there's a lot of talk about the three Vs of big data. Um, I would contend that they're not as important as what we're going to talk about next. Um, and these are input metrics, right? These are the types of things that are going in to the problem we're trying to solve. Um, data sheet type of information. This is, this is, this is important, but I, it's not the be all end all. What I want to talk about is how Forrester defines big data broadly, because we, we take a perspective beyond just security, right? Um, but you'll see how this applies to security as, as we move on. So big data is the frontier of a firm's ability to store, process, and access all the data it needs to operate, make decisions, reduce risks, and serve customers. Now, clearly, uh, as security professionals, we do have customers that we have to serve. Um, obviously, we're all about uh, risk reduction, or at least understanding the risk so someone can make a decision about how to proceed with that risk. Um, and then finally, it's about making decisions. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper. Uh, before I mentioned uh, input metrics, and this is where I think the, what's important about big data in, in the security context and broader is what is the output of that? You know, the data is needed to operate, make decisions, re reduce risks, and serve customers. Once again, very important. Um, how relevant is this data to you? One man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, some uh, a solution provider that you work with may be able to give you all kinds of great big data, but it's not your industry. Maybe it's targeted attacks against critical infrastructure, and you are in retail, and that's just not what your threat model looks like. It could be great data, but it's not applicable to you. What's the output and how is it going to help you? Um, I think those are really key things to think about when we're considering the, the vendor's uh, ability to help us with big data. Now, I mentioned some data points uh, that I was going to bring in, right? So Forrester, we're an analyst firm. We love research. We love survey data. So we do annual surveys. We probably have, I don't know, 20 or 30 different surveys that we do. Um, and this is one that uh, that uh, is, is a little different. I, I started to work with these a little bit more. This is business decision makers. So we have an annual security survey, and we just got that back in July. And this is business decision makers. And the question that, that we asked these respondents was, which of the following technology initiatives are you asking IT to prioritize over the next 12 months? And the number one, 56% of respondents said, improve the use of data and analytics to improve decisions, business decisions, and outcomes. So once again, that ties back to the definition that we had about making decisions. Uh, that's what this is all about. I, I always think it's interesting to step outside of the security or the IT world and think about what the business decision makers are looking for. So anything that we can do as IT professionals that help with this is going to be successful for our, or, or make our organization successful. Okay, so let's dig a little bit into the state of big data security usage today. This is very immature um, when you talk about companies running their own big data infrastructure. Um, I did a panel at RSA, uh, I almost said Europe, in San Francisco in February about big data and the future of big data. And there's maybe 200 people in the room, something along those lines. And I, uh, I, I asked everyone who's, who's deployed a SIM solution, and the entire room raised their hand. And I said, who's deployed a SIM solution successfully? And, Almost everyone's hand went down. And then I said, who has a big data implementation by looking at from a technology perspective, using Hadoop, using MongoDB, something along those lines. And very few hands went up. Now, I did have one of my panelists was from an e-commerce site, and they were very much into to, to, to big data. They had a culture of, of uh, business intelligence, um, and that kind of culture 
uh, made it much easier for them to look at the security use cases for big data. But broadly speaking, we're very immature here from an adoption perspective. Um, it's large tech companies, as I mentioned, the e-commerce sites. A lot of the financial services companies are using big data to look for fraud. Um, one of my colleagues, Andras, um, does a lot of research. This He actually has some work coming out on fraud and big data here uh, probably next month. So if that's of interest to you, uh, states, follow, follow us on, uh, on our webpage. And then MSSPs. Any MSSPs that you're working with, obviously, are adopting big data to provide uh, all kinds of benefits to their customers, and then also the technology companies that we've talked about. Now, SIM alone does not equal big data. Um, I would contend to you that big data is all of the data in your organization, and certainly SIM is a component of that. Um, but taking a SIM solution and rebranding it a big data solution, that is not big data. So be aware of that. It's a component of it, um, but it's not big data. Um, and, and today, for most companies out there, I don't know if anyone uh, watches the show Sons of Anarchy, but I always use this analogy, um, one percenters versus 99 percenters. In Sons of Anarchy, this motorcycle outlaw, biker club, they're one percenters. They're the cream of the crop. They can do whatever they want. They're powerful, all the resources that they need. And then there's everyone else. Um, security poverty line is also one um, that, that, that other folks use to describe that haves and have nots. Um, whatever analogy you want to use, right? They're, most companies today aren't working with big data and they're getting it from their business partners, their security providers. So how do we uh, leverage it for InfoSec or what are some of the things that we need to think about? Well, I think, and this applies to SIM and I think it applies to the broader big data as well. You're only as good as your data sources. If you have bad data, you're going to be doing analysis on bad data. And so we really need to make sure that we have high fidelity data sources uh, to make sure that we're making business decisions, risk decisions, right? If you go back to the definition of big data that I use, um, it, it's important. Um, I also think having lots of visibility is important. And I think this is where, uh, you know, ultimately companies are going to start moving towards in, in the future their own deployments of big data, and they're going to be leveraging that for a lot of purposes internally. Um, and that's great. You're going to have unique perspective on your environment. But I think when you look beyond your environment to the service providers that you're using, you know, all big data is not equal. People are doing analytics on different uh, volumes of data. Um, so depending on what your use case is, uh, you know, your, your vertical, you know, wider visibility across the globe, across regions, across verticals, you know, that's going to benefit you. Um, once again, I think stuff, uh, what happens, the output of big data needs to be relevant to you. I have a, and I don't know, I'm sure um, you're familiar with, with House of Cards. I think this is a really great uh, big data example, and I don't know if you're aware of this. I, Forbes did an article on this, um, I don't know, earlier in the year, I think maybe Q1. But Netflix used big data to make this show. Go, go out and Google this, because this is pretty fascinating. We need to find the House of Cards example for information security. Um, but what, what, what Netflix did is they looked at user behavior patterns, and they did this before they even brought the show to market. Um, they looked at the, there's a, a, a British show that was similar type of uh, premise, um, that they looked at viewership and, and when people watched, when they paused, how long they, they watched, got a lot of data off of that. They looked at, they cast Kevin Spacey in the main character's role based off of preferences and what people like. They cast the director uh, of the show also for this. So they basically stacked, there's a, speaking of cliches, they stacked the deck for this show to be successful from the start. And um, it's, it's wildly popular and it won three Emmys on Sunday. So we need to find those types of examples um, uh, in, in the InfoSec space. And I know Dan, when he moves on and talks about some of his stuff, is going to talk about some, what I would call the house of card examples for InfoSec and how OpenDNS does it. Um, moving on to predictive analytics, uh, another uh, force your definition, uh, the software and hardware solutions that allow firms to discover, evaluate, optimize, and deploy predictive models by analyzing big data sources to improve business performance and mitigate risk. So once again, um, this is the broader definition of big data, but you can see how it applies to information security uh, practitioners. Um, big data, predictive analytics, uh, leverages machine learning, statistical analysis, visualization, and I know Dan's going to go into how OpenDNS does some of this stuff specifically um, as we transition to him in a few, in a few slides. Um, 
But I think the, the, the key piece here that I think about big data analysis is we're trying to minimize our whack-a-mole, right? We are so responsive. Uh, uh, we're never ahead of the curve, right? If you look at your organization from a day-to-day -day operations perspective, and, and before I was an analyst, uh, I was a sales engineer working with companies for several years, and before that, I was a practitioner for about 10 years in InfoSec. And I was always treading water. I was never proactive. I was putting out fires all the time. I do feel that, that, that big data analytics for security, it gives us an opportunity to, to be proactive, to reduce some of the, the attacks that are coming in, to minimize them, to detect them in advance. I think that's the promise of big data analytics. Um, becoming proactive uh, and, and, and stopping the whack-a-mole game. You know, if you want to play whack-a-mole, go to a circus or to a county fair. Let's not have whack-a-mole being part of our day-to-day -day jobs. So back to output. I talked about output um, before and, and, and how do you measure uh, the output of a big data uh, implementation that you're leveraging yourself or, of course, externally through, through a vendor. Once again, is what's the result? Are we seeing benefits? If I move to solution X and they are doing big data analytics, um, what changes did we see? Uh, when you're doing um, incident response and you're doing after action reviews and you're going back, and I don't think companies do a good enough job of this, evaluating the security controls that you had um, in this whole attack and, and how the people moved into your environment and did whatever they, they were trying to accomplish. You know, what, what security controls were effective for you? And start digging into that, peel back the onion, um, ding, ding, another dumb analogy, um, and find out what's going on. And, and that's how you do it, right? It's, it's don't take my word for it as an analyst. Don't take uh, an SE's word for it. You need to see the proof in the pudding, right? What's the benefit? And, and start measuring that. Um, is it cutting down on your response? Uh, I think that's a, a nice way to do it if you're looking at, the number of incidents that you have over a period of time, the amount of effort from an operational perspective that's going into it, at what point of the attack are you blocking it, those kind of metrics. This really ties into you know, your, your typical incident response types of metrics that organizations um, need to have. Um, one of the, uh, I know from, from Dan's slides, he's got an example with OpenDNS and the recent Syrian Electronic Army stuff that I touched on at the top and some of the protection that they, they provided. So I know he'll go into that a little bit more. But I think those are the bullets that you're dodging, and you need to think about that. Whenever the next big X happens to your space, to your vertical, to the broader community, do the solutions in your environment that are leveraging big data provide you some protection? And then final, final thoughts, right? Now, we need silver bullets, or we want silver bullets. Uh, we have tough jobs. You know, we're talking about operational um, challenges organizations have. We always talk about uh, reducing friction for the or causing friction to the attacker to slow them down. What about all the friction that we have in our own environments that we cause to ourselves because we don't have the appropriate resources because we have complex processes or no processes at all? Um, we need to to have that silver bullet. We want that silver bullet, but we need to realize there is no silver bullet. Um, the latest APT in a box, big data, they're not going to solve all of our problems. Are they going to help us? Sure. Um, for those of you, and this is going to be a future line of research uh, for me about rolling your own and doing big data analytics internally for security purposes specifically, um, it's not turnkey, right? This is, the, you know, if you look back at the, the challenges we had with SIM, we're going to have challenges with big data when we do it ourselves. But um, it's it's a science. This is not an art on 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 analytics. Uh, and and I've talked to a lot of vendors and got um, briefings on how they're doing stuff in the background, and, and, and there's definitely science involved here. It's, it's not the, uh, it's not plain cut. Um, you're going to have to have staff capable of doing this. I think that's why there's a lot of competition for data scientists. Uh, so I think that's why the natural progression to start off with this kind of stuff is using it and taking advantage of the vendors that are providing it for you. Um, that's our natural starting point. And as time moves on, um, three years from now, we'll be much better at this. We'll be more mature from a company to it themselves. But I think this is the natural starting point. Um, so with that, um, I have. If you have questions for me, I'll turn it over to Dan. But I have my my Twitter handle on there. So if you have questions or follow up, I'm active on Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. All right. So I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what we're doing here at OpenDNS around big data and um, talk about a technology we released um, in November of last year called the Security Graph. 
and how the security graph uses big data to help protect our customers and uh, predict threats before they happen. So uh, just stepping back just a, a really quickly and talk about the threat landscape and what's happening. Um, you know, um, I agree with Rick, you know, that there's, there's always the threat to jewelry, things are happening at such a rapid rate and, you know, it's, it, you don't have to convince people really that things are getting worse over time. However, it's important to kind of figure out what, what are the components and, and why are they getting worse over time? So the way we think about that is there's kind of this, this massive amount of these commodity and bot botnet and, um, you know, kind of malware Monday um, stuff that's happening. And, you know, the challenge there really is just the sheer volume. It's happening all the time. The barrier to entry and to create these types of things is, is very low. And it's really about, you know, how do I prioritize the stuff that is coming across my network that may not be the most nefarious, but it's just a pain in the neck. And, and you know, you have to clean up the issue and figure out whether it's, not, um, it's something um, that's important. And then at the bottom right, we have kind of this low volume, but high sophistication, which is, you know, what you hear about in the newspaper. These are the you know, targeted attacks, espionage, state sponsored, um, you know, the advanced malware, which is a lot more sophisticated. This is typically going after an entity, a set of, you know, kind of segments or sectors and is, you know, has a different goal in mind. And that's usually not about the individual behind the computer. It's usually about the company or the organization and extracting data, um, you know, from that entity and or gaining some type of intelligence. And of course, the challenge here is that, you know, today's security products are really predicated on the fact that they need a copy of something, typically a copy of, uh, of the attack. So that could be, you know, a virus, a Trojan, you know, a botnet sample that could be, an email with a link in it, it could be a network capture. Um, and the challenge is that um, because the volume is so high, it's hard to keep up with that. And of course, um, if the volume is low, but it's very sophisticated, you may not have the, the correct purview to actually get a copy, in which case you are um, inevitably reacting to the problem. And, um, and of course, the other challenge is that there's a lot of human involvement here. There is a lot of art to this challenge. So, you know, at the end of the day, there are researchers that are looking at these samples and, and deconstructing them and then updating and looking at the, the telemetry and figuring out how to protect their customers and pushing things out to protect them after the attacks come out. So, um, you know, security graph and, and our big data, um, you know, methodology and our systems that we built here was really around designing security ahead of the pace of change of not just the attackers, but also of the infrastructure and the way that people are computing today with, you know, in this post-PC era. And, and certainly big data is not the, you know, the one single thing that is gonna help solve, you know, tomorrow's security problems. However, it's an important piece of the stack that, that many vendors aren't using and are missing. Um, so we have a full stack of, of security things we do, everything from, you know, our research community to our, you know, internal researchers to content-based classifiers, reputation systems, behavior analysis. At the very top is our big data security graph. And that's really what we're going to focus on um, here for the next about 15 minutes or so. And so I took, um, you know, Forrester's a great, um, you know, definition and kind of uh, modified it a little bit to, to, um, to map to security and how we think in, in terms of how big data maps into our uh, security stuff that we're working on today. So it's big data is the frontier of our ability to store, process, and access the necessary data or intelligence to effectively predict threats, connect seemingly disparate items, and turn data into actionable intelligence in order to better protect our customers and provide attack insight. So this is really all about staying ahead of the problem and potentially getting more intel or more information about one piece or seemingly um, kind of unconnected or disconnected pieces of information, putting them together. And for us, it started off with building a research team that was different. Um, so when we started thinking about how can we build a team and, and you know, solve this problem of massive amounts of threats and very sophisticated threats, um, and when we looked at big data, the first thing we was, was you know, immediately evident was, well, we need data scientists. And we need the ability to take massive amounts of data and not just query it, but also people that have the mathematical expertise and the algorithmic expertise to be able to build classifiers based off of the data and then push those classifiers out and then, of course, predict um, threats before they happen, ultimately protect our customers. 
And so what's really the science behind that? And the science for us really starts off with data. And, um, you know, it's really important that the, the data is diverse. Um, you know, if you are only collecting data in one segment or one geography or maybe across one, one protocol or one plane, you are going to miss, you know, information. You're, you're going to miss data. So we actually have um, about 50 million uh, plus users around the world um, in about 150 plus countries um, across everything from consumers to nonprofits to higher ed to Fortune 20 companies. Um, and it's great to have that diverse set of traffic to understand how the threats, where they're coming from, who's, who's you know, launching them, where they're going to, and how wide uh, the net is um, for those attacks. And we have 21 data centers spread across the world that, uh, that they need. And the features and the attributes of these are things like, um, you know, the traffic where people are going. When was the first time we saw it? When was the last time we saw it? Um, was it, uh, you know, um, just DNS? Or was there another protocol involved, like HTTP or IRC or, you know, proprietary protocol? And, and how many people are, are, are going to these sites? And how are those connected and correlated? So we take this massive amount of data and we pull kind of these features and attributes of the data, and then we store it in a, in a big data um, system, which is based off of Hadoop and, and um, Hive and Pig and a number of, of kind of, um, I would say, off-the-shelf um, big data technologies that are stored, um, you know, in our data center. And then our researchers build algorithmic classifiers, and our data scientists are using things like machine learning and graph theory and pattern discovery to cull the data and score the data, and the data is domains, IP addresses, and autonomous system numbers or networks on the internet. So our goal is to score everything on the internet with either a negative score between zero and 100, and there's varied levels um, within the negative spectrum of bad, and or positive score between zero and 100, which of course is good. And then on top of that, we have our own research team, and we have a trusted security community that helps classify, build, train, and tune the classifiers that go out to all of our customers and that create these scores. So, um, you know, I completely agree with Rick that, that nothing is better than examples. Um, you know, we can talk about, you know, our technology and how it works and, you know, and, you know bamboozle you with all these, uh, you know, all these acronyms. But at the end of the day, really, you know, we recommend our customers put their stuff, you know, in, in, in their network and prove it out. But, you know, um, one thing we can do is actually show you examples of things that have happened, how we've actually categorized those and how we predicted them. So we're going to take a, first a quick look at kind of a commodity, what I call a commodity threat. Then we're going to take a look at uh, two of the more nefarious things that are, that are out in the Internet. So the first one is, is, um, you know, I'm sure all of you, um, you know, uh, practitioners have seen these come across your network in some way. These are really the, the kind of spray and pray attacks that, you know, have gotten a lot more sophisticated throughout the years, but their motive really is around infecting and stealing information off of the end user that's behind the machine. They're not targeting any company, organization, or any type of data or segment or sector. They're targeting the individual. And although that's not great, um, you know, obviously it, it's not good for your, for your individuals within your company or your organization to have their machine infected and you have to clean it up and you have to deal with, you know, the aftermath of that. It certainly isn't the most costly from a brand and an information leakage standpoint. So these, um, you know, the latest run we've seen, you know, they use that shipping, uh, you know, fake shipping uh, pack. Could be for UPS, FedEx, or DHL. Essentially, the user clicks on a link and they get infected. Um, and here you can, you know, th this particular infection is something called Telios, um, which is a botnet that, that's um, fairly new and it, it's actually fairly sophisticated because it updates itself quite frequently. And it uses a, uses a pretty sophisticated network of command and control. And this is just a, you know, a little bit of information about Telios. You know, it, it has its own proprietary communication protocol. It um, uses a fast flux network that allows them to move the domain all over the place and, and um, you know, avoid being taken down. And um, it also logs keystrokes. And you also see the virus total um, results here of the latest sample. So you can see, you know, five days after the attack comes out, only two out of 46 AV vendors actually even know what this attack is. So very low detection rates. And that's really just because 
there's the volume of it is, you know, it's somewhat sophisticated, but really it's about the volume of the attack, which is hard to keep up with these reactive systems. So this is a screenshot of um, the command and control of where um, this malware is going. Um, and uh, the uh, what the security graph or our big data um, intelligence system knows about it. So the first thing you'll notice here is you see a score. Um, this is scored negative um, 74, which means that none of our users will actually be, go be able to connect to this. Um, and the reason why it scored a negative 74 is because our algorithms scored that based off of the fact that, fact that actually it was a fast flux um, domain. And um, the features and the attributes of that are things like what is the time to live of the domain? How many, how many um, autonomous system numbers is it hosted on? Where are they located? How frequently do they change? How many countries are they in? Um, and a bunch of telemetry that we've collected over that. So this is a great example where we don't need a sample. We don't need a copy of the attack. Algorithmically, we were classifying the command and control and preventing our um, users from connecting to this getting infected or from being part of the, uh, the bot. So uh, another couple examples, um, they're in the, kind of this bottom right here, which is really about the harder to stop things um, that are a lot more damaging to companies. For the, the first example, which I was actually really surprised didn't get more press, was um, something that um, uh, some companies um, called the uh, CALC team um, and um, FireEye called APT12. And this was, um, you know, the attackers actually went after people that were attending the G20 summit, um, which was recent, and they they gathered some intel on um, who was going to be attending, and then what, the, what were the documents that actually those attendees would be getting? So, for example, they would get, um, you know, the agenda of the summit. They would get some information on details of who was presenting at the summit. So they would basically take those same PDF documents, and then they would hide their Trojan within the document and send them out to, um, to all of the attendees. So, uh, you know, a pretty, uh, pretty interesting attack that is clearly going after high-ranking officials that were going to, uh, to the summit. And here's some information on it, um, intents to download. It uses, um, you know, a, a fairly sophisticated, um, you know, uh, PDF exploit. Um, but at the end of the day, it connects out for command and control and for, um, to get more binaries over HTTP to a number of uh, domains. And so we plug those domains in the security graph, and uh, you know the first thing you'll see here is the volume. This is very low, which means that uh, you know this is clearly targeted. You know, high attacks um, go after tens of thousands of people. You know, and we see high spikes of those over time. These are really low under the radar attacks. So you can see here, we algorithmically classified this as a negative 94, which is a very bad. Um, before the attack was actually even launched. And then we have some more details as to why that happened. Um, so this one actually was um, an algorithm um, that we created called SecureRank, which, um, you know, a simple explanation of it is that we rank domains based off of their connections, the client connects us to them, and then where all those other clients are connecting to, and then create a score based off of that. So it's almost like Google's page rank, where they're looking for popularity, we're actually looking for infected machines and how the behavior of those machines is changing and correlating to other machines and how those machines are connected um, to the servers. So this gives you just some more information that we pulled out of security graph that has, you know, negative scores here around secure rank, um, around the prefix score, and then what are the domains they were hosting, where they were hosted, and how many people were affected uh, by it. The last example um, that uh, the Rick talked about was, um, you know, the most recent attack um, from the Syrian Electronic Army, um, with it, which is um, starting to um, be called SEA. Um, they actually even call themselves SEA. So um, within our security graph, um, you know, the researchers also have a visualization tool, which allows us to visualize elements of attacks. And algorithmic classifiers are a great way to negatively score things. But sometimes a picture, you know, really speaks a thousand words of how things changed over time and how the algorithm actually caught something. So I took some screenshots of our interactive um, tool here um, to help demonstrate what happened. So essentially what happened was, um, you know, a registrar in, um, in Australia um, got compromised. Um, you know, jury's out on how that actually happened. Heard a number of different um, kind of theories around that. But the net was that 
the SEA went after this registrar and changed key domain elements for Twitter, for the New York Times, and for the Huffington Post, and a couple other uh, properties. And what they did was they, they pointed all of the traffic for those domains to the SEA server. And so this is a picture of what twitter.co.uk, what Twitter images, what the New York Times, and what the Huffington Post looked like before the attack happened. And the first thing that you'll see is that none of these are connected. They all have their individual domains, their name servers, their IP addresses, and their autonomous system numbers, which are all, of course, not connected. These are all separate entities. They're not hosted on the same locations or in any way um, correlated. Then if we look at the, the relationship of these domains after the attack, the first thing you'll notice is that they're actually all connected. So Huffington Post, Twitter Images, TwitterCO.UK, and New York Times are actually all connected. And they were all connected through this IP address of 141.105.64.37, which was hosting the name servers and the domains for the Syrian Electronic Army. And then you'll see another interesting connection or a correlation which is the network that was hosting um, the slash 24 that was hosting 141.105.64 was also hosting a number of other Syrian Electronic Army properties and a, num a number of other criminal properties for PayPal fish and for banking phishing and for um, Gmail um, stealing credentials and for a number of other nefarious activity. And so putting a picture to that really helps you understand really how our algorithm can actually combine and kind of um, connect these disparate pieces of data and score them. And so we've, when we plug this into the security graph, you can see where the users were going was this IP, this 141.105. It was resolving to the SyrianElectronicArmy.com and to SEA.sy. Um, it was a negative 77. You can see the spike here, which was pretty amazing that within minutes, um, th that domain and that IP address went from zero to 75,000 connections within about the first 30 minutes. And what that was was everybody that was going to these Twitter properties, New York Times, and these other locations were getting redirected over to this, this bad IP address. So we scored this bad IP and this bad domain, which meant that all of our customers were protected from actually connecting. So when they were going to NewYorkTimes.com, they were actually being prevented from going there. And we're preventing them um, from connecting to you know, whatever you know, activity SEA was behind. So you know, although, although there is you know, a lot of you know, kind of marketing stuff out there around big data, and, and certainly we, we believe that you've got to put you know, the vendor um, you know, or the technology to, it, to the test you know, to prove that what they are telling you is real and it's not um, you know, just marketing hype, because surely everybody will be talking about big data and there will be and just like cloud, you know, multiple different definitions of, of, of how it works and why it's valuable. But we really believe that the combination of big data and, and applying big data to, to a large diverse data set can help you predict and find attacks um, before they happen and ultimately protect our customers um, from connecting to these sites um, from, from either being um, infected or from potentially containing the attack once it's in. You know, in these advanced kind of bottom right malware attacks, it's really almost becoming more about containing the attack because inevitably they are going to get in. And if they do get in, now it's about what do you do once they're in your network and they are looking at the data and trying to extract that information and connect you to a network. So with that, um, of course, uh, free trials are, are available from us. Um, if you're interested in that, you can simply email sales at opendnf.com. Um, for any technical or product questions, feel free uh, to email me. This is you know, my direct uh, email, dan at opendns.com. Or, of course, you can uh, connect to us over Twitter to at GetUmbrella. Um, we'll also be sending out um, you know, the recorded uh, version of this webcast that you obviously feel free uh, to send to your colleagues.